Welcome, everyone. We are um, going to honor and respect your time, and we're going to get started tonight. Uh, this focus tonight will be action and reaction. Last week, we talked about the difference of uh, protest, advocacy, and organizing, and emphasized the importance of organizing. And this will be, what does it look like for us to act? I want to read a few quotes that we uh, want you to think about tonight. It's from a book called Separate by a guy, an author named Steve Luxemburg. This quote, this first one is from uh, Frederick Douglass spoke these words. People in general will say they like colored men as well as any other, but in their proper place, who is to decide what is their proper place? A theme was beginning to run through Douglass's speeches. In action and excuses ensured that prejudice would always triumph. And then the next quote is, history is, is made, not ordained. And sometimes our perspective is when we have something happening in our world, in our society, when we see the world as it is, we think that it was ordained that way, that it will always be that way. And not always realizing that the world is the way it is today because of how people have acted in the past and that we are here. And so as we've been talking about organizing, I want to first encourage you in this that you have seen organizing all around you. Whenever one person chooses to share their life with another person, um, we have to organize. So maybe you have used Google Calendar with someone else or a family member um, or someone in your community or a church ministry. Uh, in order for people to live in community, there has to be some level of organizing that happens so that we can share life together well. Or maybe you're a part of a group text that helps communicate. Um, these are ways that we, as human beings, begin to organize all around us. Uh, some more complex ways is if you live in Baltimore, or you can live in many other cities, if you've ever looked and you think of what's happening in the community when it comes to drug dealing, it's a very organized um, endeavor. It's nothing unorganized about it. And so even we use this phrase organized crime. Whenever people get together with a shared agenda, a shared action, people have to organize themselves. And so it's all around us, organized religion. If you think about it, we are an organized church. We have a set time that we meet every week. We have a set time that our small groups meet and we have organized one another around each other um, so that we can be in community together. So organizing is technically already all around us. The question for us in this time is, what is our part that we're playing in how our community, our local community, our state community, and even our nation is organized as a society? Are we and engage in actions that bring about a, a community that is organized around the central theme of justice. Um, I wanna give another example in, in how the community is organized. If you live in Southwest Baltimore, there's a place locally near my house that gives away free food every Wednesday. And so if I go outside, what I'll see in the order of my community flow is I'll see a lot of people walking through the certain pathway to get to this house to get food every Wednesday at noon. What I also see because of the organizing of my community is I'll see drug dealers out in the corner right then at noon. They're rarely out there at noon during the other days, but they're there on Wednesdays because they know that there will be people who could be tempted by what they're selling who are going to get food on Wednesdays at this place. So you can look at how we all interact, cross paths. All of that is how we have organized ourselves as a community. And again, the question that we're asking in this time is what is the church's role? and organizing our neighborhoods and community. I would say that too often uh, we think of being too in, in engaged, not engaged and just uh, reacting to what's around us rather than acting and shaping what is around us. I wanna give you a few perspectives of people who have acted throughout history. Many times you might think of history and realize in this term, ter current time of racial strife, you might realize that there's a lot that you didn't learn in history. And you might realize that there's a lot of people's stories you did not know were in history, people from different people groups specifically. But one other thing you might realize too, is not only is their presence missing in history, but also their actions is missing in history. So even if you learn African American history or Asian American history, or you, you learn an immigrant history, when you begin to read it, you might realize that you're only learning what happened to that people group without realizing what that people group might have also acted and done. And so we might be missing how actions have actually shaped our present day. So I'm gonna give a few examples of maybe some things that you don't know. I'm gonna put some pictures up on the screen too so you can get an idea of what these people look like just because it's fun. Uh, Major General Benjamin Butler was a general during the Civil War. And at some point when he was fighting in a Civil War, 
uh, he made this, this decree that slaves were fleeing from the Confederacy, going to the Union, and the people in the Confederacy would say to themselves, we want you to give our slaves back. What about the um, Federal Fugitive Slave Act that was, in, that was law prior to the Civil War? And this man, he took this action. He said, well, if you believe that slaves are property instead of people, then this in war, whenever you take property from someone, there you have com commandeered it, which means it is legally yours. And so he basically did this action to show how foolish it was to think that slaves were actually property. But if you think they're property, you actually have no right back to them. But if they were people, um, we had to treat them with dignity. And so he put uh, the people in, in the Confederacy in the weird position of realizing the folly and their perspective of, of how they viewed slaves. And so by putting that law into place and saying, if you think they're property, according to the rules of war, any property we seize from you belongs to us. Uh, that's General Benjamin Butler. I also want to put up a picture of Homer Plessy. And Homer Plessy took this action. He went on a train, and he is a, he's a black man who could pass as white. And when he was asked by the train conductor whether he was black or white, he said, I'm black. And if you've heard of Plessy versus Ferguson, that, that ultimately the Supreme Court said that people should be separate but equal. There was nothing wrong with desegregation. It was this man who took the case all the way to the Supreme Court. What was his action? It was intentional. He went on a train as a light-skinned man saying this, who determines who's black and who's black enough and who's not black enough? And they just took this action looking for the reaction of who determines? Is it the conductor? Is it the mayor? Is it the police? Is it the courts? And they did this action to show the folly in this determining who determines who is black enough and where they sit. This what case, again, went all the way to the Supreme Court. He eventually loses. But I want you to see his action that would cause a reaction in shaping our society. Uh, a next person I want to put up on the screen is uh, Claudette Colvin. Now, Claudette Colvin, you might not have heard of her, but maybe you've heard of someone who came after her named Rosa Parks. Claudette Colvin was a woman who also did not get up out of her seat. And I want you to just know her story because the civil rights movement came around her and was going to support her and go to court as they did with Rosa Parks. However, Claudette was a young woman and she was pregnant out of wedlock. And for them, they knew if we took this action with her, the reaction that they would get would be about her morals rather than the just laws. And so they had to find someone who could be in some way publicly uh, clean of morals so that the issue at hand, the reaction at hand, could only be the law. So history has not heard about Claudette Colvin because um, they knew that the reaction that she would get if she stood up for civil rights, unfortunately, would be about her being immoral rather than our laws being unjust. And the last one I wanna share is um, the Haitian Revolution. And maybe you've heard about this, but there was a revolution in Haiti and they fought for their freedom from the French and they won. And some people would actually say this, the action of people fighting for their freedom in France and in Haiti beating the French is what led to America getting the Louisiana Purchase at a, such a cheap price. Because the French were tired of fighting and getting their butts kicked by some people in Haiti, they thought to themselves, we don't want to fight again to take care of a territory in a very distant land. And so instead of fighting America like they had intended to do, because they got so tired of fighting the people in Haiti, because of that action, their reaction was not only are we leaving Haiti alone, their other reaction was this, let's just give this land to the Americans for cheap. And so we might not realize that part of the black agency in our world has often shaped the world that we live in. And so I wanted to share some actions with you and encourage you with this. We live in a time today where we are being called to action. And it's important for you to know that every action that we take, we, take to, we can do individually or collectively. Individually is that you go to someone and you just meet and you're present in their world and their lives. Collectively means how do we do this together? How do we take actions? And every action is often looking for a reaction. And this is where we might get a little bit uncomfortable because sometimes we take actions and our only expectation is that someone will agree and that someone will affirm my actions. But when it comes to organizing and changing society and shaping our world, it is how do you act in such a way that you get a reaction? And that reaction could be, man, I agree with you. That reaction could be, I'm indifferent toward you. That reaction could also be, I despise you. But the success of your action is not based on affirmation. The success of your action is that you get the proper reaction. So the example I give that's a little bit 
very general and easy to understand. If you love cats and you were to make an action that declared that cats are the best pet ever, if you do that action very well, then this is what you can expect in reaction. I expect cat lovers to be like, yes, that's amazing. You will know if you did a good action, if that's the response you get. And you'll equally know if you did a good action, if dog lovers despise you, right? And so when we do actions of organizing, it is important that when you act, you always do it with the expected reaction in mind as you move forward to those actions. Action is a tool to agitate. And that's the word that usually might be uncomfortable, uncomfortable for us. But agitate means to stir up public discussion. So individually, you can run an action, is what they would say, toward an individual. You can sit with the person and you can just speak words and ask questions in such a way that it stirs something up in them that they hadn't realized before. It stirs up leadership that they hadn't acknowledged before. It stirs up passion and agency and hope that they hadn't be realized before. I remember sitting with a person who's an organizer and they kept asking me questions of why I'm here in Baltimore. And I kept telling them my normal answers. And then they pressed a little bit more and they said, all the things that you've said, your faith in Jesus Christ, your education, your experiences, many, many people have had the same thing. But tell me, George, why are you still here? And I remember I had to pause. It took me a while to really press in deep because this person had stirred something in me. And honestly, no one had ever asked me that question. Why are you still here? And so action stirs something up. So when you meet with people, you can move forward and press and get to the heart of their passion, the heart of their leadership. And the action is I want to stir something up in that person. But when we do things collectively, it is how do we stir something up that reveals things that are happening in our world? And action is used toward that for a reaction. So a successful action, it gets the expected reaction. Any reaction is evidence that you've become active in the public sphere. Any reaction is evidence that you become active in the public sphere. What I mean by that is, if no one's reacting to you, no one's reacting to your position, no one's reacting to your stance, no one's reacting to your perspective, that means that you haven't put it out in the public sphere. There's only reactions when we're actually being active in the work that we're doing. Um, it's not about agreement or acceptance. Actions are really about starting discussion, accountability, response, and change. If you can act in a way that causes people to, to ask questions, that cause people to begin to understand something, that cause people to respond to something they hadn't responded to. That is the goal of actions. Reactions reveal the matters of people's hearts and the reactions reveal the matters of our society. When you do an action, you wanna make it concrete, you wanna make it specific, and you wanna make it focused. If you go back to the examples I gave through history, they were very, very focused on what they were trying to address and highlight. And then they took an action to target that and look for the reaction to reveal either the folly or to reveal um, what they wanted to address. And so it's important for you to be concrete, specific, and focused. And the last thing I'll say about actions is you want to refrain from spending so much time trying to persuade more than taking action. So I guess to give you a quick idea too, what you put on social media could be an action. So sometimes we just share our thoughts just to let people know it and that's fine. But sometimes you can sit and say, I want to make this statement because I want to stir conversation. I want those who already um, are, are in the work of justice to feel inspired in it. And I also know that if I inspire them, then people who think injustice isn't right, their reaction is gonna be irritation. And that's okay. But I wanna stir those who are ready in action. So your posts on social media, your engagements with family and friends can not only be an exchange of seeing how people are doing, but you can actually begin to act in such a way that stirs up in people passion leadership and a longing for justice. And we can collectively do that in such a way. They can have people in political places, honestly, people in church, church leadership and other areas that can stir up and say, I can't let you be comfortable. I'm doing this action to reveal something and I want this reaction. Um, a couple of resources that come to mind of people from a the perspective, their history and action would be uh, the heartbeat of wounded knee. This is a history of Native Americans in America, obviously. Uh, but it won't be what happened to them. It'll be about their own agency. There's another book called A Nation Under Our Feet, which is about the African-American community and how they actually organized the community during slavery, civil war, and post-civil war. And another book is The Union of Their Dreams, about how people in the Latin American community worked together to fight for fair pay. Um, we're going to break up in our breakout groups, as we usually do very soon. We'll put those questions on the screen. As we did last week, 
I encourage you, we're not going to assign someone to lead. We ask that you would choose someone to lead. That will be your first action to someone in your group. You're going to stir someone towards leadership that maybe didn't uh, think that they could lead. You don't have to answer all of the questions, but we ask that you just spend time pressing deeper and getting to know one another as you ask these uh, questions that are also up on the screen. When we come back, that person who has been chosen as a leader, we're going to give you about 90 seconds to just share a highlight or two from your discussion that you've had in your group time with one another. The example I want to give as you leave is this. A number of people in our church family has asked me, George, what do we do about justice? What do we do about justice? What do we do about justice? And what they don't realize that in asking those questions is that they were actually putting action on me and saying, George, we're stirring something in you saying we need leadership. We need something to react to. Whether we like it or not, there's nothing to react to. So the question, what do we do, really stirred in me, you know what? They're challenging me to lead because there's nothing for them to either like or dislike which means that there's no action, there's no leadership that's taking place in this specific area of justice. And that's why this call exists. This call was me being stirred by people in our church family that said we need more, and my reaction is this call. And so I'm looking forward to hearing how you all engage with one another in the breakout groups. And if you have questions that people answer and you want to go a little bit deeper, be okay with stirring some passion and leadership in one another by asking more pressing questions. So T, it's going to break us into groups right now, and I look forward to hearing your feedback when you come back.